December the 21st, 1997. I would like for you, if you would, pick up your bulletins and I will read to you what's on the front page. If we wish to see God day after day, our faith must be of a better quality than we ordinarily give proof of. Our constant prayer should be for an increase of faith. If we wish to see God, we must believe in God incarnate. To believe in God incarnate, it is not enough to believe that in a human vesture, the Godhead is somehow mixed together with man. It is to believe that his human vesture in all its particulars belongs to and is the proper clothing of the divine. It is to believe that if God the Son is to be discovered on earth by men, he is to be found clothed in all the elements of his humanity and in all the circumstances of his humanity and in all the conditions of his humanity. It is to believe that the life of Jesus Christ on earth amongst men is the divine way of living on earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. It goes without saying that we are approaching the day called Christmas and that we need, above all things, to enter into that occasion with the right sentiments, with the right spirit. If we look at Blessed Joseph, we see in Blessed Joseph the purity of the divinity. If we look at the Blessed Virgin Mary, we see the immaculate beauty of the divinity. And if we look at Christ himself, we see the divinity in human form, in human vesture. These were the ones that the evening before, with an urgency that had to be considered extreme, were seeking a place in a foreign land, in a distant land, for her to bring forth her child. The moment was imminent. And Blessed Joseph had to be under serious pressure. If there was concern, there was pressure. And so he was forced to go from place to place to place, looking for a place for her to be relieved of her burden. And every place he went, the door was closed. Did he lose his composure? No. Did he fuss and fret? No. Did he complain? No. And in plain language, did he pitch a fit? No. And he put one foot in front of the other until Almighty God brought him to the place that was in Almighty God's mind from the beginning. Because in the estimation of Almighty God, there is no difference between the palace and the stable. There's no difference. 
And so he brought him to the only logical place fit for a king, the king of the universe. If we look and keep on looking at St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother, we find peace. We find serenity. We find meekness. We find humility. We find piety. We find truth, among others. Now, we wish to have these beautiful, qualities, and we seek, at least the thought occurs to us, that we seek the services of someone to put us in peace, to put us in the path or on the path of joy, someone who can put us in the field of meekness, Someone who can make us humble. Someone who can show us piety. Someone who can demonstrate truth. My beloved people, no human being on earth can give us truth can give us peace, or serenity, or meekness, or humility. These are gifts. These are gifts that come directly from the hand of Almighty God. And these gifts are not given to us at random, simply because we have asked for them. And when we present ourselves to Almighty God, as long, please note, as long as we can only say we are trying to be peaceful, as long as that, as that is all that we can say, we do not have the gift of peace. As long as we can only say we are trying to be serene, we do not have the gift of serenity. As long as we are saying that we are trying to keep anger down, we do not have the gift of meekness. As long as we can only say that we say our prayers regularly, on schedule, in no way means that we have been given the gift of piety, and so on, and so on, and so on. We will be given these gifts only after we have succeeded in stripping away the things that prevent these gifts from being given to us. Let us for the moment look at the alcoholic. The alcoholic is a man or woman, unfortunately. The alcoholic is one who drinks, who is addicted to alcohol. It has been brought to his attention that this is a problem, and a very serious one at that. Until this person, with almost brutality, with, with almost brutal force, strip himself of alcohol, 
he will not have the gift of sobriety. The force that has to be used, and you, unless you are an alcoholic yourself, or unless you have lived with an alcoholic, you cannot appreciate the severity of this force. Does he ever get over alcoholism? Of course not. He will be an alcoholic till the last moment of his life. But for something that he has done, he has been given the gift of sobriety. And that is that he has put into muscle, he has put muscle, that he has been able to put muscle into his decision and has brought his alcoholism into control. And for that reason, he has been given a gift. He never ceases to be an alcoholic. He never ceases to struggle to keep the control over this base tendency. And so it is with us. We are addicted to anger. We are addicted to restlessness. We are addicted to impatience. We are addicted to pride. We are addicted to self-will. As long as we are proud, as long as we are given to self-will, as long as we are given to anger and so on, we cannot expect these gifts. These are the gifts that come only to those who have learned to bring them into control. Does that mean that a man, that a man ceases to have the tendency to anger? He will be prone to anger till the day he dies. And he has to strip himself with the same kind of brutal force that the alcoholic has to use. That's inevitable. It isn't a matter of saying, tomorrow I'm going to be sober, so I'm going to push a switch, and automatically I'm sober. Or I want to be at peace, so I go in the closet, and I take out my, my sweater that says peace upon it. And I put that sweater on, so I am, a, I, I'm, I'm at peace. Or that I'm going to take out my prayer book a little bit more, and so, therefore, I will be pious. I will be, I, I will just be pious. Doesn't work that way, my beloved people. The struggle is intense. And the struggle is severe, and it has to be conscientious. If we wish to be given these gifts, we have to strip ourselves of these other tendencies of ours. And there is no hired help that can help us across this. The alcoholic has the, uh, the, the sponsor, we know that. The sponsor does not pick him up and put him on the level of sobriety? Not at all. The best that the sponsor can do is to be there when he is about to jump. That's all. That's all the sponsor can do. And to carry him across that gulf just this one more time until he has put into practice the control that will keep him sober. And thus it is with us that we want to have the spirit of peace, the spirit of serenity and meekness and humility and piety and truthfulness and patience and all the gifts that can only come from the hand of God, not from any other human being. We have to attend to this business of our tendencies and it will hurt. Of course it will hurt. 
So we have to make a choice, one or the other. And until we make this choice, we are in grave danger of losing our immortal souls. And as we raise children, they can smell as they are maturing. They can smell our lack of serenity. They can smell our anger, even though we go come in with the biggest smile in the world pasted upon our faces. They can smell that something is wrong. They can, they can, they can determine the spirit of the house when we enter in. And they know that from that time forth, as long as we're in the house, they will have to tippy-toe around us in order to keep things in balance. And for that reason, they possibly are learning on their own to become masters of deceit, our little children, in order to keep things peaceful. My beloved people, I have been standing in this type of location now for 18 years. And this is an exceptionally long time for one priest to be in one place. And I have seen tiny little children in my day who were absolutely beautiful and wonderful and displayed all of the traits that beautiful little children should display under the control of very, very interested, we'll use the word, parents. But something, an ingredient, was left out because in those 18 years, almost without exception, I've seen these beautiful children turn away, and they're gone. Let us not be so foolish as to say that it will not happen to mine, because these are the words that are used all the time. It will happen, or rather I should say, it can happen, and the probability that it will happen is very great. The Feast of Christmas is on the way. Attitudes, strong attitudes, are developed during this time of Christmas. And even though we say it is not so, you have to admit in honesty that we are quite distracted at this time with materialism, with modernism, with consumerism. We know this. We're all involved in this. And some of us sometimes get on guilt trips because we realize this. And we want to keep Christmas almost in its pristine beauty. We want to keep Christmas a day of prayer, which is fine. I do not condemn that. But the spirit of pride, materialism, all those distractions are still in evidence and our tiny little children are looking and listening and observing and forming opinions and growing up to big children and growing up to bigger children and growing up to still bigger children. But we tamper with Christmas and we do not really know how to bring our distracted, materialistic, consumeristic impressions to become in harmony with the simplicity and the beauty of Christmas. 
We do not know how to bring them together, not in a spirit of compromise. So what do we do? Instead of bringing them together, we move Christmas about. Some of us move Christmas. And this attitude, I dare say, some of us have learned from leaders coming from foreign shores who have funneled this kind of impression to us from time to time. We've moved Christmas. Some of us observe Christmas on the Feast of the Epiphany. Some of us observe Christmas on New Year's Day. Some of us observe Christmas on the Feast of St. Nicholas. What's wrong with Christmas Day itself? Our children are looking and learning and seeing and watching and growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And when they come into their own, not having been taught how the two forces can be brought together, one in service of the other, they've never learned this because we did not teach it to them. We isolated Christmas. We isolated Christ. We isolated our children. We put ourselves in cocoons. And when they burst forth from the cocoon, I've seen it, my beloved people. I told you a moment ago, in 18 years, you can see a whole bunch. And when they break loose, they're gone. Never to return. And then we ask ourselves, then where did it all go wrong? What happened? I was talking, this week has been a terrible week for the telephone. And it comes at you from every direction. And only last night, only last night, I had a telephone call from a man, 40 years of age. And guess what? He's a priest. And a good one. A very good priest. And he's having a lot of trouble. Just a bunch of trouble. Extremely depressed. Extremely lonely. Extremely out of it. Not knowing what to do. Because in his youth, in his young childish child, in his childhood days, they tampered with the whole process of Christmas. And at the age of 40, a priest is still struggling, suffering. This will never end for him simply because somebody insisted on doing it his or her way. Not being concerned about the needs of the children as much as being concerned with their own adult needs, this man is distorted. And not only that, this distortion doesn't end with Christmas. This distortion goes with him throughout the entire year with all of his dealings with human beings. Isn't this a sadness? Isn't this a tragedy? Of course, when we come to Christmas, you say Christmas, uh, Christ was born in a stable. Of course, I have preached that time after time after time after time, and you may hear it again Christmas Day this year. And the stable was simple. The stable was what a stable is. It certainly is not all of this extravagance that you see here. 
Of course not. Nobody said it was. When we look back at the central point of all of his, man's history, the, when the incarnation took place, it is explosive. Can you imagine that in heaven the angels were regimented, you know, right foot in front of the left foot as they were singing everything in harmony and everything was perfect? It must have exploded in heaven to the degree that, it ex that its explosion broke forth on earth even and invited certain people, certain men to come and see. And so it must be with us. It should be explosive. And there's a move on foot, and I've seen it around. There's, there's something tainted about Santa Claus. If there's anything tainted about Santa Claus, it's because we, ourselves, the mothers and fathers, have used some inferior paint to paint him with. And therefore, he's ugly. He's sinful. He's to be scorned. He's to be put down. He's to be avoided. He's to be done away with. Remember we read just a moment ago, he, Christ is to be found in all the elements, in all the circumstances, in all the conditions of his humanity. Santa Claus is not evil. Santa Claus is a good man. He's a wonderful man. And Santa Claus helps us make the celebration that much more wonderful. He is our servant. He is the servant of our little baby Jesus. And our children should come to understand that. He is no ogre. If he is, we have put the cloth clothing of an ogre upon him. Santa Claus is to be fostered because, listen, if we divest Christmas of its beauty, of its prayerfulness, of its goodness, our children, when they grow bigger and bigger, and bigger, and they come into their own. My beloved people, they will be totally taken up with the consumeristic distractions that are theirs to have. We have to understand this, and we have to understand it well, or we will lose our children. And that is a tragedy. So I beg you, please, as we approach this wonderful occasion that we will come to understand our duty in bringing this to our children with all of the loveliness and the kindness and the gentility that comes from a Jesus or a Mary or a Joseph. We have to do this if we expect to succeed my beloved people.